Good evening, folks. This is attorney Mark Thompson. Welcome back to the Paul Revere Show. We are here Monday, every Monday at 7 to 8 on the Shaw, WAUK, 540 AM, 101 FM. We've been on the air now for going into our second year. We have been dedicated to the proposition of talking about democracy in Wisconsin, how to make Wisconsin a better place, how to keep going forward. And I am uh, honored to have as a guest this evening, Jody Havish Sinekin, a candidate in a special election that will take place on April 4th, 2023 for the 8th Senate District. Welcome, Jody. Thank you very much, Mark. I'm happy to be here tonight. So the uh, let's just start out with share with our listeners who you are, what's your background, and then we'll get into why is Jody jumping into this race in the middle of you know these some some people call it sort of crazy times in politics. So, hello, Jody. Very glad to do that. Well, I was born and raised in Milwaukee in uh, Fox Point and have lived here in the Senate District 8 communities, a a number of them, for really most of my life. I very much feel that I reflect the values of the district. My husband and I raised all four of our kids here, and they went through the school systems and all the activities of our communities. And I have worked here also for the past 30 years. So uh, I have found myself at this juncture now where I would like to step up and uh, not stand by when we're at such a pivotal time in our state's history. So before we jump into what this district looks like and why you're getting into it, you mentioned that you've been active 30 years. What have you been doing in terms of on a day-to-day basis so people have a background of what you bring to the office? Oh, very good. Thank you. I graduated Harvard Law School in 1992. I followed that up with a clerkship in the Northern District of Illinois in Chicago and worked in private practice, a litigation practice, for several years before moving back to Milwaukee in 1995, where I joined Habish Habish and Rotier and worked there, um, became a partner. And then in 2003, And ever since I have been working in environmental policy law, doing Clean Water Act enforcement actions in the beginning, and then really moving into primarily water policy with regard to appointments to special legislative study committees on the Great Lakes Compact, the Wisconsin Stakeholder Advisory Group for Groundwater Management, and wrote a series of different policy guides on water conservation and water resources, have also been very involved with wildlife management concerns and have served on the most recent DNR Wolf Management Plan update. So very much involved in the legislative process. I have testified innumerable times before the Wisconsin State Legislature, primarily with regard to the Natural Resource Committees, as well as before the Natural Resources Board and the like. I've been personally involved with drafting legislation. Wisconsin had to pass its own implementing legislation for the Great Lakes Compact to bring that regional agreement home to Wisconsin for our own administrative law and statutory law. Work closely with other legislators, advocates, and help to lead a coalition of folks around the state to ensure that we were going to be enacting a strong regulatory field for Wisconsin with regard to protecting our Great Lakes resources. You and know, I did the same, too, with other laws. I, I'm really glad you brought that up because, I, you know, I was just looking at the paper this morning, and, and there's a huge article about the Great Lakes Compact and the pressures that are going to be faced by the compact with, you know, I mean, all we read about is the water drying up in the Southwest and the crisis in Phoenix and the crisis in California. And I, I think that perspective really brings a unique position or, I mean, a great knowledge to this race. I mean, you know, we're right up, right? I mean, we're your district 
part of it's got to border the lake, right? It does. Um, a number of the communities do. Um, Mequon, Whitefish Bay, Fox Point, Bayside, Grafton, they're all along the, many portions of those communities are all along Lake Michigan lakefront. So it, let's just stretch it out. You, that's sort of the eastern side of the district you're running in. What what other municipalities, counties are involved in this? Well, other than How the ones west are, you go, right? Yeah, we sure go west. We go um, west of Mequon and Grafton. There would be Thienesville, Menominee Falls, Germantown, Sussex, Richfield. I didn't yet name. River Hills or Brown Deer, but that would be the district. I'm sorry if I left any out, but I don't think I did. I'm sure somebody will pay attention, right? So, but just before we get into like why you decided to jump in, what is this your your expertise in freshwater and particularly in the legislation for the Great Lakes Compact? How do you think that puts you positioned? with the issues that are going to be faced by folks in Wisconsin, not just in your district, but in, in the state over the next few years in terms of water? It's an excellent question because it really does give me the confidence based on my years of experience, building co coalitions and working with a variety of different interests, environmental, industrial, business, political interests, agricultural interests, on these various governmental stakeholder groups I was appointed to, we had to come forward and work together with technical experts and the like to reach policies and solutions to really tough problems. There, there was not shared agreement starting out, I promise you, for the Great Lakes Compact or groundwater, water quality concerns, puppy mills, you name it. People come from their own interests but what's important is how you work together and create some semblance of common ground and work from there by building in what regulations, what frameworks would, will be acceptable to at least make progress. And I was part of important endeavors closely involved in accomplishing that. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's yeah. really, it, it gives you a, a recognition that it can be done, the dysfunction and lack of productivity that we have been seeing for years in our legislature doesn't need to be because it wasn't not too long ago. This is a relatively new phenomena and it can be um, changed back. You know, I, I think there's no question if, you know, if you, people just common sense. I mean, we barely had any snow. We're a foot down, right? I mean, it's a balmy winter winter evening, right? I mean, it's. I mean, I was walking around today without a coat, and it was almost fifty degrees. It's and it's February, and so we know water and water issues are going to be really, really important. And so I'm glad personally that you're bringing that. So thank you. Tell us what's the significance of this special election in the eighth Senate district. And what made you decide to, what it sounds like, you know, give up some very interesting work to commit to running for office? Really, Mark, it was something that I had not expected or thought I would be doing. But after Thanksgiving, when I had learned about Senator Darling's early retirement due to health reasons, I understood that this seat was open and I then started hearing about who would be coming to vie for the seat on the Republican side. And uh, it's a very purple district, Mark. It, I too have quite a bit like the district. I am not just on one side of things. I am like all of us, complex person who has different viewpoints that fall somewhere on that blue to red spectrum. But the folks who are coming forward to a fault at that point were election deniers, uh, folks who had written and threatened Mike Pence to decertify the election, who were looking to decertify Wisconsin's election results from 2020. I know you know um, the, the whole full scale of it. And I recognized that 
they were not representing the best interests of the community and certainly were not representing the values of my neighbors and what I thought was best for Wisconsin. So I wanted to stand, stand, come forward and do my part. I know I have the skills and the experience to contribute, to make a difference, and to bring us back to moving Wisconsin forward rather than this hyper-political Folks on each side just shouting at each other, but not actually working on things together to make things better for us. So that's where I hope to contribute. So before we get into some of the key issues, and I'd really like to, I'm assuming you've been doing some doors and yes. you've been to some communities. Yeah. Generally, what's the reception been like? What are you hearing at the street level in terms of how people are responding to your campaign in general? I have to say I've knocked doors so far in Sussex and Grafton the last two weekends. And to a fault, I have been received so kindly and warmly. People have just been thanking me for coming forward and stepping up. They're concerned about how things have been going in Madison. They don't feel that things are getting done and that Wisconsin is falling behind, falling behind our neighbors, falling behind uh, where we should be and becoming a less attractive place for people to want to live, their kids to stay living there. I hear a lot of that. Their kids are leaving. It's, it's very personal to people. They want, they want their families to stay in Wisconsin. But it's becoming more difficult for Wisconsin families to stay together under the conditions that have been presented to us by legislators in Madison. So in, say, 30 seconds, what's at stake in this election on April 4th in terms of what it means for the Senate and the Senate vote in Madison? Why is the 8th district seat so crucial? This seat is absolutely crucial because without it, if it does not flip to a Democratic seat, there will be a supermajority in the Senate, which would cost Governor Evers the ability to veto particularly harmful extreme bills. And that puts Wisconsin in a treacherous position with regard to extremist interests. Folks, this is attorney Mark Thompson. This is the Paul Revere Show. We are here with Jody havish Sinekin, who is running for a crucial seat at the 8th Senate District. Hello, folks. This is Attorney Mark Thompson. This is the Paul Revere Show. We are here every Monday night from 7 to 8 p.m. to talk about democracy in the state and how to keep going forward, right? That's our motto, going forward. This evening, I'm uh, privileged to have with me Jody Habish Sinekin, who is running for the 8th Senate District seat, special election, a key, key spot. So you're out there campaigning, put your hat in the ring. So uh, like, what are the key issues? And let's just spend some time talking about them. You bet. Thanks, Mark. Uh, no doubt an issue that is front and center on most people's minds that I have been meeting at the doors and meeting at events and who have become familiar with my campaign is women's health care. Actually, healthcare even broader across the state, but it really starts there. We have a legislature right now which is refusing to move forward from a pre Civil War 1849 law, which criminalizes doctors and those who provide abortions to women. And that 1849 law, um, notwithstanding, the special session that was called by Governor Evers to create a path forward from it, a modern approach. Um, the legislature back on October 4th, they gaveled in, they counted one 1,000, two 1,000, and then they gaveled out, no discussion. Same thing afterwards in the state assembly. And that is completely 
in contrast to the majority of Wisconsin citizens who do want us to examine that 1849 law and bring it up to date and take into account modern realities. That really is where people are wanting to talk. And I have been doing that. I have spent weeks now speaking to doctors and women, healthcare professionals, and lawyers who represent doctors and healthcare facilities. And what is happening here in Wisconsin, and I know you're very your listeners are certainly reading the newspaper, is that we're creating a situation in a matter of months now where Wisconsin women who are suffering health care issues, not just focused on the abortion. Other folks try to frame it as just about abortion access when really it is far broader. I know you've read in the paper that women who are suffering miscarriages, dangerous situations, cannot get care in Wisconsin and are literally being rushed to the borders, like in a war situation, to get the medical care they need. The same thing is going on now with women who are experiencing problematic pregnancies, scary situations where their doctors say, we don't know what to do with you. We can't treat you because we could lose our license. We could go to jail, hightail it to a different state. There is that whole discussion in the newspaper comparing Wisconsin to Minnesota, the tale of two states, they called it, and how Wisconsin women just do not have the same rights or the same opportunity for healthy lives now in Wisconsin, given our legislature's refusal to move forward on this critical part of our health care options. What this is doing and what folks have to appreciate is that the 1849 law targets doctors. So that's emergency room doctors who have someone come in in a terrible situation, a woman coming in, and they cannot render care without getting some permission from a politician vis-a-vis -vis their, their hospital board. And that chilling effect is not just affecting OBGYNs and internists and emergency room doctors, which people think would be the ones who would be implicated, but the medical field in general, because cardiologists and internists, dermatologists, all of the folks I've talked to have explained that they have trouble already recruiting the best and the brightest talent from around the country to come to Wisconsin is a pipeline to help them because they don't want to move here under these circumstances, especially those new doctors who have young families or who intend to have young families. Heck no. So it's putting Wisconsin at a significant risk of having a health care provider shortage, not just in the future, but in the near future. And that is what I've been hearing from doctors and lawyers who represent doctors. So it's a far greater issue than just the right to choose. I, you know, I think that's uh, very, very important. I mean, I've just I've been listening carefully here. A lot of people have just framed it just as a, a, a woman's choice on reproductive rights. And I think there has been very little discussion of this broader. What you know, when you're campaigning and throughout your district, it's purple district. What are people saying when they they find out how this is impacting doctors and women and the just general care? To a fault, they are not at all comfortable. They're almost in disbelief that the folks who have been elected to office are not doing anything about it, that they're not appreciating it, the larger implications of sticking with an 1849 law. They're just refusing to act. And what I am understanding is that if folks want different results, if they want progress on important issues like health care and Wisconsin's folks' ability to have receive medical care from qualified folks, we need to put different people in office or we can't expect different results. 
Folks, this is attorney Mark Thompson. This is the Paul Revere Show. We are here talking about democracy, and Jody Haber Sinekin has talked eloquently about the risk to reproductive rights, health care in the state of Wisconsin, and why the special election in the 8th Senate District and April 4 is so crucial. Thank you. Hello, folks. This is attorney Mark Thompson. This is the Paul Revere Show. We are here every Monday night from 7 to 8 p.m. on the Shaw, W-A-U-K, 540 a.m. Here in Waukesha, the heart of purple Wisconsin. We always talk about democracy and moving Wisconsin forward. We are here this evening with Jody Havish Sinekin, who is talking about the key issues in the 8th Senate special election for the 8th Dis- Senate District. So, Jody, welcome back. We we're talking about the archaic 1849 law and why it's got to go and why, you know, I just have to say this, right? 1849, all white men passed the law, no women voting, and we have a Senate dominated by white men who are like pushing an 1849 bill. But let's move on. What what's another hot issue that's that you're out there talking to voters about? Yeah, thank you, Mark. Another big issue that's front and center on the folks I'm talking to throughout the district is safe communities. Um, we all are aware of the spike and violent crime over recent years and continuing the reckless driving that we're watching on the news and actually have personally observed. I assume many of your listeners have seen it also. And I too share that concern. I have made it a point to go around the district and meet with police chiefs from a number of communities. My goal is to meet with all of them throughout the district. I've gotten about a third or almost a halfway there now. And the meetings have been really interesting. And no matter where I've gone, uh, I'm hearing a very similar story, which is that police departments, law enforcement, in whatever the community, whether it's in the far northern reaches of the District 8 or in the far southern portion of District 8, they're all experiencing a inadequate amount of money and resources to be able to practice proactive policing. And what they explained that to me is that they have not been able to increase their staff since in some cases, 2000, 23 years ago. And so they're in a reactive mode rather than proactive, which is allowing crime to go under the radar, particularly human trafficking and other concerns, which have really been burgeoning in the suburbs, which you probably are aware of. So they feel that the inattention or legislators not making it a priority to adjust the share revenue formula available to local communities, particularly law enforcement, fire and emergency services, and putting them in a place where they don't have enough opportunity to do their jobs the way they want to do them, to avert a growth in crime. And I've heard all different examples of it, but it's actually raising my concerns rather than alleviating my concerns when I talk to these folks. You know, a a lot of people have heard about the, you know, shared revenue in the context of schools. You know, you hear uh, very often there. I I don't know whether listeners and folks are so aware that the shared revenue and essentially the state is starving local communities has this huge impact on safety and good policing. So I. How do you see that issue teeing up in the district? And you told us what some of the police chiefs are saying. What are the voters, people that you're talking to? What are they thinking? 
it's the same frustration. Why aren't they making this a priority? What we've seen over the last few years is the legislature pointing at Milwaukee and the Milwaukee area saying, shame, shame, there's all this crime. But when there's a request for more resources, more police, more squad cars, more special units, it's no, we can't. We're not sharing more. We're not sharing the resources that you're requesting, which is causing them to be strapped and unable to deal with the problems at hand. Again, just people are pretty commonsensical. In recent years, crime has not gone down. It has gone up. There, we're sitting now on this unbelievable seven plus billion dollar surplus. We have an opportunity to invest in our local communities, particularly the emergency and law enforcement services that we need. But local communities are also having shortfalls when it comes to keeping their parks up, keeping common spaces and their services. It's all part of the same problem. So if folks want this to be a priority, they're going to need to get new faces in Madison representing them because those folks, I mean, some of the legislators who are running against me have been in office like Dan Canodal since 2009 in the majority party. In that time period, they should have been able to get this done or at least make it a priority to get the resources where they're needed, not just in Senate District 8, but around the state. So, you know, your your opponents, what do you think is behind their reluctance to re look at shared revenue and let the communities really weigh in on local control issues? You know, because historically your opponents have framed it sort of like Milwaukee versus the rest of the state. But if I'm listening to you, that's really not it. You're, you're talking to police chiefs all over your district and, and you're not part of Milwaukee, right? No. Right. So this is like, has nothing to do with Milwaukee and they're addressing it. So why do you think there's this tone deafness in Madison? I'm not sure. It's a really good question. I've actually thought about it because on one hand, you hear a lot of talk about being pro, uh, pro law enforcement, but words are cheap. It's, it's your actions that matter and the effect or the consequence of the policies that they're supporting, such as the shared revenue, the actions the effect of them is literally choking off the ability of law enforcement in communities like District 8 to be able to do their jobs effectively, maximize it. And yes, we are not Milwaukee, but we are right against Milwaukee. Um, a lot of the district is very close. So for the legislature to be seeing Milwaukee as an enemy or it's it's ignoring the reality that we're all interconnected in communities. What is a problem of our neighbor becomes a problem of ours. And the police are all on the same page with regard to this difficulty that they're experiencing. So again, we need legislators who will be able to look at a problem like this and work together. Enough with the political games and the talk about who's right or who's wrong philosophically on spending. Let's just make sure that our local communities are being taken care of as they need to be. The, the, this issue of public safety, does it come up? You, you mentioned fires, fire and fire departments. How, how do you see it there? You said you talked to police chiefs. Have you also had a chance to talk to any of the folks that are responsible for fire departments? I have meetings set up actually, but I do have an understanding that there's been efforts for consolidation and other means to be able to shore up the ability to respond to emergency situations. But again, the margins are so thin, there's very little room for error. So uh, I feel that there is this stress that local communities like District 8 are feeling, representative around the state, really, that they are 
either experiencing like Grafton, I think it was $150 or $200,000 budget cut for this year. That's just Grafton. Other communities are also experienced either a moratorium or a cut on the resources available to them. So they are having to borrow to be able to get through the coming years. It's very challenging across the board how legislature has been dealing with our local communities in government. And um, it certainly is a priority for me. If I am elected, this is something I really want to work on because it it really doesn't make sense. So when you're asking how is this making sense, I have to answer to you, it's not making sense. You know, when you're out talking to folks, are, are, yeah, because this is a purple area. Mm -hmm. But it's it has been majority red, so it's a red purple, not by that much in the you know the last few years. Do you sense amongst the public generally a really willingness to like let's rethink through the partisan politics and you know give Jody a chance? I sense a frustration. People are getting impatient at the lack of progress over recent years. There's just this kind of not giving up, but everyone just seems to not be able to get along and work together anymore. That general sense is what I'm hearing. And this overwhelming sense, as I mentioned to you, that we're falling behind. We're here in Wisconsin and we're looking at our neighbors and they're progressing. They're bringing in new jobs. They're encouraging our kids to move there for better opportunities. Young families might not be running to move to Wisconsin, not just because of our healthcare situation with that 1849 law, but also we just aren't doing more in our economy and with our taxes and the like to attract families and businesses here. So it's it's that sense of we're falling behind. Let's get our acts together and start moving forward again. So you you, you touched on investing in Wisconsin in the future. The let's sort of shift from public safety to that and we'll spend some time on it now and you know and more later so how how is that uh, how do you see that investing in wisconsin and the future how do you see that as an issue what are people are saying and what is jody saying what's your program well my program really is listening to folks at this point you know is i'm not in office as of now so i'm really listening to understand where people's concerns are. And they're feeling that our business climate, our tax system, even our investment in our education, the UW system has been falling behind, largely because of this infighting, this hyper-political situation where there's not representation in our legislature that reflects the diversity of our state because of unfair maps and the like. So there is this frustration where there's a feeling of a lack of representation by many folks and that the politicians are not really interested in working with folks from the other side of the aisle or really doing much to progress. And it's more of that rumbling and grumbling is what I'm hearing. Uh, I am very much a believer in what you put in is what you get out. And that certainly goes to education, that certainly goes to economy, and that goes to our children. So we really need to figure out where we want to get to, or otherwise we are going to continue to fall behind. We need to make Wisconsin attractive to a place so we can bring workers in. Um, I'm sure you've covered it on your program, but we are continuing to experience a shortage in workers to fill our factory jobs, our retail jobs, our restaurants, you name it. So we just need more people coming into Wisconsin to keep our economy strong and, and make our state where it has once been. The uh, key, it seems like, or 
A key is education, development of the economy. More on that in a minute. Folks, this is attorney Mark Thompson. This is the Paul Revere Show. We are here every Monday night from 7 to 8, WAUK, 540 AM, 101 FM. We are here with Jody Havish-Sinekin talking about moving Wisconsin forward. This is attorney Mark Thompson. This is the Paul Revere Show. We're here every Monday night from 7 to 8, WAUK, 540 AM, 101 FM. Tonight with us is Jody Haversinikin. She is a candidate, the Democratic Party candidate for the 8th Senate District seat, Keys, a key race. And uh, she was talking about how she believes in investing in Wisconsin's future by focusing on education, vocational opportunities, and uh, alleviating tax burdens. So what are some of, some of the specifics of those issues that you're promoting in your district, and how are people responding? Thank you, Mark. What I'm really coming to understand is how important it is for us as Wisconsin to continue our long tradition of investing in our schools, investing in our public education available to all kids across the state and certainly in Senate District 8, but also apprenticeship programs and other vocational opportunities. We're hearing about shortages in the trades, plumbers, electricians, uh, construction folks, we just literally need trained people um, to help keep our economy chugging along. And that goes for schools. Um, like you, I've been reading in the paper and hearing from folks that with COVID and with teachers and schools having the limited resources that they have been dealing with for now, gosh, 10 plus years, they're, it's having an effect. It's having an effect on uh, our students how they're performing academically, and also how they're going to be faring in the future and being able to contribute as our next generation. So I want, certainly as a parent of four kids, I want what my kids had. My kids are growing up now, but we definitely received a phenomenal education. We had the choice to send our kids to public school, to private school, we certainly did not um, use any public dollars for any private school choices, but we in the district and around the state have that opportunity. But it's critical that our state keep the investment up in our public education system, because for many communities, that's the only game in town. And we need to make sure that that, which is the focus of most communities, that they have that available to kids with special needs, to other kids, so that the teachers have the resources to provide the best possible opportunities for our next generation. You know, the... Uh... There's been a lot of discussion by the Republican leadership in Madison on this flat tax issue. Uh, how, how how do you approach that issue when you're out there talking to folks that, you know, I, I come from sort of old school. When I was young, I was a steel worker. I, I, I relied on good contract benefits. And at a time, you know, it was quite a while ago now, uh, but, you know, there was a time when the very wealthy paid 90% taxes and they were still the wealthiest people in the world. And now we're talking about a flat tax. How, how do you see that issue playing out in your district? And are people talking about it? Yeah, I heard about it in Grafton on Saturday um, from a number of different folks. What people recognize is there does need to be adjustments in our tax code, no doubt. People are just, we just have too many, too high of taxes in Wisconsin, especially on people who seem to be working the hardest. 
working class people, middle class, it, it's just disproportionately high compared to many other places in the country. What folks are wondering though, is with a flat tax, how it's going to affect the state and them in terms of critical services, again, circling back to our earlier part of our talk on resources available for law enforcement and local communities and our public schools, we need to have forward thinking and to make our adjustments to our tax code in a way that's intelligent and is thinking about how we can sustain our services, our quality of life, our kids' opportunities, while at the same time giving those who need it the tax relief that they're looking for. So right. it really it really is going to need to be something that lowers the taxes for Wisconsinites, but not at risk of Wisconsin. You know, are, are people, you know, when you're talking to them, are they aware of the proposal really reduces the tax rate amongst the very, very wealthy the most, and there is really no benefit for working people? I mean, are people aware of that sort of sleight of hand that's being played on them? Yes. I heard it from, gosh, five or six different households where, where you know, it's stopping. They get it. They get it that um, folks I talked to, they were making under $100,000, both of them working um, in each of those households, um, dealing with child care costs, the whole deal. And they were saying, you know, the folks making over four hundred thousand, over five hundred thousand dollars, they don't need to be getting taxed the same way we're getting taxed. Yeah. They they get what a flat tax without any adjustments at all looks like. So um, I, I can't say that they were at all enthusiastic about that proposal. I, I have sort of a a question that's not directly, I think, part of your campaign, but we have a very important race for the Supreme Court on April 4th, but there's a primary for the Supreme Court race on February 21st, right? A week from tomorrow. And you've been out there on the sort of the front lines talking to people. How do they view that race and the importance of that race, right? Because I'm I'm saying, you know, get out and vote for Jody on April 4th, but on February 22nd, Right. We want to get people out and vote. Right. So what are you hearing? I have to say on the door knocking that I've been doing and the meetings and the talks I've been giving, even though I am looking for the eighth district Senate seat every single time I am talking about the importance of this Supreme Court race, um, talking about Wisconsin on a tipping point. This Supreme Court race is going to literally decide our future. On becoming before this court is going to be our fair maps and voting rights for Wisconsin, our democracy. And it's going to be, again, this women's health care, the abortion um, challenge that Attorney General Josh Cowell and Governor Evers are challenging the 1849 law that is being pursued by our legislature. Those both those cases are going to be before this Supreme Court. We have to decide as a state. And the only way we can do that do that is by voting on February 21st and again on April 4th to see who we want on that court. Because if not, we are going to become an entirely different state if we don't make our voices heard. Thank you, Jody. Folks, this is Mark Thompson, attorney Mark Thompson. This is the Paul Revere Show. We will be back next week. Thank you for listening forward, Wisconsin. And thank you, Jody Habersinikin. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, 